Welcome to Radio 5G. It is September 4th, 2019. Today we're going to play a hour uh, recording of an interview with Dr. Martin Paul, Ph.D. Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry and Basic Medical Science, Washington State University. And Dr. Paul is the one that we've seen the video YouTube of him making the statement, quote, putting in tens of millions of 5G antenna without a single biological test of safety has got to be about the stupidest idea anyone has had in the history of the world, end quote. At the end of this uh, tape, Michael Henry Dunn and myself will be back to discuss the information. Thank you for being here. All right, we're back with Martin Paul on part two of our conversation on the summit. Uh, Dr. Paul, welcome again. Uh, Glad to be with you. So we're going to get into the five most critical areas in terms of areas of, of, of human health effects that you've identified that, that you're, that you you can kind of sum up for the audience. This is in, in, deeply important that we uh, identify and, and comprehend this information and then help it to, to proliferate. But before we do, I want to ask you, what are, what is an overview according to the science of environmental or ecological impacts from EMF radiation? Well, yeah, I want, I want to talk specifically about 5G because um, let, me, let me just say, uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in the broader sense that you raised it, um, the, the EMFs work on the GCCs, on basically any animal cell, even in you know, various invertebrates. Um, they also interestingly work in plants in much the same way. Uh, there's a, a specific kind of channel in plants. It's often called TPC channels, a uh, channel which, um, um, when it, it has a similar voltage sensor to the ones that we talked about in the last section. And so that voltage sensor, uh, can activate that channel. And when it does that, it allows calcium to flow into the plant cells. It's not as specific as the BGCCs for calcium, but that's the main effect is through calcium. So, so it, uh, so the upshot of that is that the EMS work in plants and, and animals and various sorts, um, you know, in, in very much the same way. Uh, and, uh, with regard to 5G, as we said before, there are gigantic 5G effects near the surface of the body. Uh, but there are also effects that go very, very deeply in the body. And, but nevertheless, the surface effects are important. And so what the consequences of that is, is that Organisms which uh, have much, much higher surface uh, exposure relative to their volume are going to be much more sensitive to 5G effects. And, uh, and so I expect that almost all organisms, you know, plants and animals are going to be more affected than we will, and we will be highly affected. Uh, so I expect that you know, the, the ecological impacts will be absolutely stunning and, uh, and of a sort that we can barely imagine at this point. But, um, the reason I think that, you know, plants, even large trees have their leaves and their reproductive organs highly exposed. So I think they're going to be highly, highly, uh, impacted. And the same thing goes for insects and small birds and mammals, which, which, uh, will be highly impacted. Uh, interestingly, there was a, uh, a patent that was taken out to use, uh, millimeter waves as an insecticide <laughs> because you could kill insects really easily with millimeter waves. <laughs> so there is some evidence, in fact, that, that the insects are very, very sensitive to these millimeter waves. And again, 5G, because of the extraordinary level of pulsation, will be vastly more dangerous to the insects and to, uh, you know, small birds and mammals. And I, I think, um, um, so I'm expecting massive ecological impacts of this. And, uh, one of the things I'm specifically expecting has to do with the impact on plants because EMFs in plants, 
uh, makes the plants uh, produce much higher levels of highly volatile and highly flammable terpenes. You can get like hundredfold increases in these uh, terpenes. And, uh, and so they become highly flammable. I mean, it's like spraying them with a light spray of gasoline. Uh, and I think a lot of the problems with the California fires, in fact, have been caused by this, um, by, by the EMFs. And, um, that takes a longer argument than just, just mentioning it, but, uh, I just wanted to mention it. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we have just gigantic, huge fires all over the place from, uh, from 5G. And, uh, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's true. Can we just t- so, take another minute and dive into yeah. that? How, because, uh, I've heard Jack Cruz talk about this as well. Like how does, um, uh, electromagnetic radiation, wireless, and specifically 5G, how does or would it cause fires, forest fires or, you know, house fires? Well, we know about smart meters causing house fires, but can you, can you just, can we dive into that for a brief moment? Yeah, well, the smart meters is a different issue. There, there you have a technological glitch that caused the fires, but no, this is a different situation. So what happens is that um, the EMFs, uh, also working through excessive intracellular calcium, trigger a regulatory system, which in the normal plants just helps protect the plants from insect predation. And, uh, when you artificially trigger this thing, you can get much, much higher levels of these, uh, terpenes and terpenoids. And they, uh, have a number of properties. And I'm only going to talk about one of them. And that is they're very highly flammable. So, uh, and that's not the only thing that's important actually for, for fires. Uh, there are two other things that happen that are also important with regard to the fires. Um, I don't think we have time to talk about those, but, um, so I, I, you know, the, you know, as I say, it's just, uh, it's just like spraying the plants with a light spray of gasoline. They're going to be extraordinarily flammable and they are. I think this is a, uh, this is a topic of interest though. Can you, um, also yeah. sum up what are the two other things? Well, one of the things is that the, the terpenes actually act to, to spread this response to other plants. They act as a messenger. Uh, the second thing is, and I, 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 uh, that I think that the terpenes, um, when you accumulate them, can undergo the chemistry of spontaneous combustion. And in so doing, they can start their own fires, but they start their own fires under specific circumstances. Such as having high loads of microwave or millimeter wave radiation around them. Well, I'm, I'm, that's an assumption, of course, behind it, but yeah, but they, but, uh, uh, you know, basically what you need is, is very low wind conditions because you need, you need access to oxygen in order to have spontaneous combustion. But if you've got a lot of wind, uh, but you also have to accumulate heat from the chemistry of spontaneous combustion. If you have a lot of wind, the, uh, the, uh, wind will both blow away the terpenes and, uh, will also blow away the heat. So you can't have that. I think that, um, but you, if you have low wind conditions, you can generate fires by spontaneous combustion. I think, uh, by the, through the impacts on the planet. So. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. So this is some commentary, some, a bit of speculation in comparison to the other elements of what we're talking about today, which are, you know, much more established as fact. But this is your, your opinion based upon a deep understanding of, of the existing body of science. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's, there's other evidence that comes into this that, I mean, I, you know, I, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but yeah, the, there is other evidence that comes into this. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you for, for, you know, just go, being willing to go there. So diving in, yeah. your five specific areas that we're going to talk about here in this part two, neuropsychiatric, reproductive, autism and ADHD, DNA, and early onset Alzheimer's uh, and dementias. Uh, not in that order. We'll start with that last one first. What yep. is very early onset Alzheimer's, and what does the science say about EMFs and its relation to early onset Alzheimer's and other dementias? Okay. So um, 
you know, Alzheimer's, you know, historically has been a disease of old people. What we're finding is that over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so, there's been a substantial decrease on the uh, average age of onset of Alzheimer's disease, uh, which requires an explanation. And this, of course, roughly corresponds to the time when we've had huge increases in EMF exposures. That doesn't mean that the EMF exposures are causing it, but it, it suggests that it may be causing it. Uh, the, um, the other thing which is, is, uh, is true is that there is some, uh, there are some, uh, epidemiological studies which suggest that EMFs cause Alzheimer's. Um, those have involved, um, mainly, um, um, extremely low frequency exposures. And as I mentioned in the last section, the extremely low frequencies work on the same target as the microwave frequencies. So they're relevant to the issue of what microwave frequencies are, but they don't, we're not directly assessing that here. So there, there is evidence that, you know, electricians and other people who have, um, high exposures to extremely low frequencies have, uh, higher incidences of, of Alzheimer's disease. Now, um, there is a literature showing that not only Alzheimer's disease, but all of the neurodegenerative diseases have an they they each have an essential role for excessive intracellular calcium. So, as we mentioned in the last section, uh, the EMFs act by VGCC activation, and the first thing that happens when you do that is you get excessive intracellular calcium. So, the fact that those uh, you know that that all the neurodegenerative diseases have a have an essential role for excessive intracellular calcium, of course, is consistent with the idea that the uh, EMFs should be able to uh, uh, to trigger these. Um, the the other things that have been shown is that you can get increases uh, in uh, uh, neuronal cells and culture of the uh, production of the amyloid beta protein, which is characteristic of, of Alzheimer's disease. So you get this effect from the uh, amyloid, uh, you know, on the uh, big increases in the amyloid beta protein. And there are uh, plausible mechanisms by which this can occur. And in particular, uh, we mentioned in the last section that uh, NF-kappa B is activated by by the EMFs. And, uh, and NF-kappa B, in fact, increases, uh, you know, when you increase NF-kappa B, you increase... Uh, the uh, the level of uh, crucial protease activity that's involved in producing the uh, the uh, amylo- the uh, beta amyloid protein. So you know, so all of that. So you know, when you look at mechanisms, you, what you see is you see there's there's a lot of evidence that's consistent and and uh, and specifically uh, that this is going on, uh, or at least it may be going on. Now there were two really crucial. Studies that were published uh, by a um, research group in China. I think the uh, senior author is Jiang J I A N G et al. And they uh, um, they found that if you gave a whole series of short pulses to uh, rats, to young rats. And then you stopped exposing the rats. So you just did this for a certain period of time, and then you stopped. And then you ask, you know, what happens when they're in the equivalent of middle-aged rats? And the answer is absolutely stunning. What you see is that all of the rats that were irradiated appear to have the equivalent of Alzheimer's disease. They have the usual problems with memory and behavior that you see in Alzheimer's in humans, and they also have high levels of the amyloid beta protein and oxidative stress in the brain, which again is, is what you find in Alzheimer's disease. So, um, this is a, a truly stunning. Now, you know, we talked before about the fact that 5G is extraordinarily highly pulsed. That's, you know, that's what it's intended to do is to extraordinarily highly pulse. So one, you know, so it's reasonable to expect that you're going to get huge responses to these pulsations. We do have experimental evidence uh, that, again, I, I referred to in the last section, that um, millimeter waves 
which are the frequencies that will probably be used with 5G. They, there are some people who are backtracking on that. Um, can produce effects on the EEGs and brains of humans and therefore can impact the brains in other ways because they're, they're, you know, they, you, you're seeing impact on those brains and, uh, on human brains. Uh, and that doesn't include all the pulsations, which 5G will entail, which, uh, you know, everything we know about pulsations means that that's going to make things vastly, vastly worse. So it's reasonable to expect that 5G exposures will produce a similar effect to what you see from the pulsations in the rats. And if it does, then we will produce either universal or near universal uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease from 5G exposures. I mean, that's, you know, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that I have absolute proof of this. What I am saying is that we are taking risks of the sort that no rational society on earth can possibly take. This is not something that any rational society would even, even think for a microsecond is something that might be acceptable, uh, an acceptable risk. So, Martin, I just want to jump in here. So there's many studies that indicate this risk and this, this, this risk in our, um, neuro, neurodegenerative, you know, diseases that, that are all increasing in humanity, um, mm-hmm. relating to EMF and, and wireless and millimeter wave radiation. That one study that you mentioned, um, the, uh, was it a Chinese study that, that looked at that just to, just to confirm? Yeah, there were two, there were two, two Chinese studies. Yeah, the same group. Okay. Mm. So just to confirm, you're saying that those studies were mice or rats. No, rats. Rats, rats. that were exposed with pulses earlier in their life, but then not exposed. And then later on in their li- lives, they showed, yep. uh, Alzheimer's like condition. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and let, let me just say Alzheimer's in humans is thought to have a long latency period from the time it starts to the time you start seeing symptoms. And so, you know, this pattern is very, very similar. Um, except of course rats, you know, and generally in rodents, things go about 15 times faster than they do in humans. But so, uh, you know, because they, they, in, yeah. So okay. anyway. now what do you say in terms of the, let's say some skeptics might have a question about, well, if you observe it in mice or rats, it doesn't necessarily translate to an effect on humans because they're just two different, you know, apples and oranges. What do you say to, cause I've, I've received that kind of comment before over, you know, educating the time of educating people about EMFs. How do you answer that? I think you answer it in two ways. One is that there is a huge literature on animal models of human disease. And so these are very, very important studies. There are billions of dollars every year that go into these studies, obviously because the NIH and other funding agencies think they're highly relevant to what goes on in humans. So, uh, you know, so, um, uh, you know, in fact, you know, so, so in fact, here, here you've got, you know, you've got studies and, and they, uh, they show this. Now, um, um, and, uh, so I, you know, and, and the other thing is that a lot of these animal model studies, in fact, are, are stunningly good models of what goes on in humans. And, and, and again, people use these models to try to determine mechanisms of what's going on in the human condition. And then, you know, it's, it's more difficult to look in humans, but once you find out how it works in the animals, it's usually a lot easier to look in humans and try to confirm that sim- something similar is going on. And so, 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 you know, these are things that are very, very important in terms of our understanding of human disease. Yeah. Thank you. So topic number two is autism and ADHD. What yeah. does the science tell us about the link between EMF and autism and ADHD. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, you know, I want to say again, the EMFs act primarily through VGCC activation and yeah. and through then uh, excessive intracellular calcium, and uh, and so uh, there is a lot of evidence from genetic studies 
that mutations in the VGCCs and also on some other, in some other genes that influence the activity of the VGCCs, that the mutations that produced elevated or excessive activity of the VGCCs can cause autism. We know that. There is no question about that. Um, and uh, the other thing which, which is clear is that there are gen- what are called genetic polymorphism studies. So here you're looking at relatively common variants in human populations where, uh, uh, where, uh, the form of the gene that again produces higher activity for the VGCCs, uh, produces increased susceptibility to autism. So that says the VGCCs are important, not just in rare mutations, but in the general population, uh, that, that, that develops, um, autism. Um, is that what and, polymorphism yeah. means? Is that a species wide genetic polymorphism? Genetic poly, yeah, genetic polymorphisms are defined as, as uh, genes in, in, in human, in the human genome where, um, the, what, the frequency of that particular form, it's called an allele, uh, is at least 1% of the total. And that then allows you to study those, you know, in populations. They're, they're frequent enough. In other words, you can study them in populations. So if I remember correctly, the one that's been studied the most is something like, oh, I don't know, nine or 10% or something of the forms of this particular gene are a form. And, and that one, it turns out is associated with all kinds of, uh, neurological and neuropsychiatric effects. But autism is only one of them. And, uh, you know, so you get increased susceptibility to a lot of different things. And, uh, and, uh, and then there are also, it turns out, um, there, there are also, uh, polymorphisms in a couple of the T-type, uh, VGCCs. We haven't talked about what those are, but they're, they're the, the VGCCs that are particularly susceptible to activation. And they, uh, they also have roles in, in, in autism. So you get more activity of those, you get more autism, uh, more susceptibility to autism. So there are a lot of things of that sort. Uh, and, um, and so, um, what I wanted to do, um, uh, and, and there are a couple of, uh, epidemiological studies that also argue for, for this. Uh, and there's at least one animal study that argues for it and in aut- for autism, uh, uh, being caused by, uh, by the MFs. Um, interestingly, uh, there are actually more animal studies that have been done with ADHD, which, uh, I think, and I think a lot of other people think is, uh, is or at least should be considered part of the autism spectrum, but just down at, you know, much lower level of effects compared with full fledged autism. Um, in in animals, and, and this has been shown, I believe, in mice, uh, if you do prenatal uh, exposures to uh, EMFs and then you stop exposing them, uh, the mice develop ADHD-like effects that go all the way through adulthood. So these are very long-lasting effects that uh, where there, there are changes in the brain uh, uh caused by the uh, radiation in uh, in utero that uh, that produce long term changes in behavior that are very similar to what you see in ADHD there's also by the way some epidemiological evidence that argues that EMFs are are involved in causing ADHD as well so you know so there's a lot of different kinds of evidence in pointing in this direction i, I think what we should talk about is that, is a, a figure that that discusses how 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 this how this whole thing works, and uh, I'm going to put on something on my screen. Which uh, so you're going to be looking at a figure here, which uh, uh, in which uh, we have uh, you know if you look at the center center top part of it, you got low intensity microwaves and various other frequency EMFs. Uh, which activate the VGCCs and produce interest, increased intracellular calcium. That's what CA2 plus I is, is the increased intracellular calcium. So you're follow, following down there towards the, towards the lower left. And the increased intracellular calcium then impacts 
five different mechanisms that are involved in the formation of the synapses in the developing brain. And so during the perinatal period, the period uh, just before birth and just after birth, um, there is a huge amount of synapse formation. So the synapses are the ways in which different neurons uh, in the brain communicate with each other. And in order for the brain to work right, it has to have the right kinds of synapses, or at least largely the right kinds of synapses. And so the synaptic formation is very important. It turns out that there are five mechanisms there you can see that control dendritic outgrowth, synapse formation, synapse maturation, synapse elimination, and also something else else called MECP2 function. All of those have critical roles in regulating the formation of the synapses. All five of those things are regulated by intracellular calcium. So this is, you know, so this is really stunning that you can get these effects. Um, and, uh, through, through, through the VGCC activation. Now, I also think that chemicals have roles in this process. And we talked about this before. Uh, in, in the earlier section, I guess, uh, you can get chemicals acting on the NMDA receptors. And you see that on the upper, upper, uh, right side. Uh, again, producing increases in intracellular calcium and they can do, they can uh, impact synapse formation as well. There are reasons why I think that the, uh, that the primary driver of the autism, uh, epidemic is probably the VGCC, uh, sorry, probably the EMFs rather than the chemicals. The main reason why I think that is that a lot of the chemicals that uh, that uh, act to activate the NMDA receptors, the increases in the amounts of those chemicals were skyrocketed in the 30 years following World War II. And that was really before the autism epidemic started. So my feeling is that those chemicals are not the primary driver. They may well act synergistically with the EMFs, however. And uh, and so I'm not saying they don't have any important roles. I think they probably do. Um, what about metals such as mercury in terms of driving autism, according to your research? And, and also metals yeah. combining with EMFs to act as antenna, if you will. Well, the metals act. Oh, yeah, uh, mercury, uh, acts also to give you increases in NMDA, uh, receptor activity. Uh, and, uh, some other toxic metals can also do that. So they can have roles, um, you know, through these pathways. And, uh, let me just say, uh, the, the action of these different chemicals, uh, they act along different pathways in order to impact the NMDA receptors. So unlike the EMFs, which are directly acting on the VGCCs through the voltage sensor, here you have various kinds of pathways by which different kinds of chemicals can act, uh, but they they uh, act along different pathways to give you um, impacts of this sort where, where you get uh, excessive intracellular calcium, and they also, I believe, can, can uh, impact then the synapse formation. So that's the basic um, pattern. And, and I think, um, and let me just say, there is a huge amount of evidence that the synapse formation is, uh, is absolutely key in autism and is of various sorts, including the fact that autism patients and including autism animal models have changes in the connectivity of the brain. And it's, and it's the synapse formation that determines the connectivity of the brain. So, um, you know, these are, these are all things that, uh, uh, that, that are, I think, quite important. What can you say about the, uh, you mentioned in your work, the role of de novo mutations that have been observed. What are de novo mutations and how do they relate to autism? Just in brief, before we move on to the third yeah. category. No, that's a very important point and it, and it allows us to move on to the third. So, uh, yeah. So what, what happens is that, um, you know, we talked about the DNA effects in the, in the last section that you get, you get cellular DNA damage produced. Uh, and the way it's produced is from the free radicals, uh, derived from peroxynitrite. 
they attack the DNA and they, you get single stranded breaks, you get double stranded breaks and you get oxidized bases in the cellular DNA. Um, those things then can produce, uh, de novo mutations when they occur in germline cells. That is cells that, uh, end up producing, uh, sperm or eggs. And, uh, because, and, and then you can, then you can pass those mutations on to, uh, to the next generation. If, um, so, uh, there, are, there are a number, of, so something like 12 to 15% of the autism patients have de novo mutations of a sort that, uh, that influences the, uh, occurrence of autism. And that, um, you know, that, that, uh, impacts either directly or indirectly the synaptic formation in the developing brain. So, so we think that, you know, that, that, uh, that these, um, that these, that these, uh, de novo mutations. So a de novo mutation is something that did not occur in either parent. So neither the male parent or the female parent had the mutation. So that means that, you know, the mutation occurred in a specific germ cell, or at least in the precursor of a specific germ cell, and that that then caused it to be passed on to the, to the fetus. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and that then, uh, increases, uh, greatly increases the uh, occurrence of autism in those, in those people that carry those mutations. So, um, so, so, uh, you know, and, and, and what's important here is the following. You know, when you look at mutations, you can look at them in different ways. So one way of looking at them is in terms of what kind of changes are occurring in the DNA at the DNA level and how can those kinds of changes be produced. Okay. So that's, so just to wrap up this second section, yeah. autism and ADHD, um, yeah. if the viewer uh, wants to go deeper, I can suggest, uh, Dr. Martha Herbert's research with, um, Harvard, where right? she's done uh, some research in this area. Um, is there any other, uh, points or any other recommendations that you would have in going deeper on autism and, and EMF? Well, the thing, the thing that I wanted to mention to you, well, I mean, there are, there are, there are studies on, on the, the role of synapses in, uh, synaptic formation in autism. There are studies on the role of uh, intracellular calcium in autism. Uh, those are things that are very important here. Uh, but the other thing I want to say here is is the following: that uh, these these the, the the three kinds of mutations that we talked about. Uh, sorry, it's three kinds of DNA changes that are produced through the uh, through uh, VGCC activation. Um, those three can produce. The major types of mutations at the DNA level that, in fact, are involved in in uh, in, in causing autism. Uh, so those are uh, those are uh, chromosomal rearrangements, copy number mutations, and point mutations. And all three of those turn out to be very important uh, sources of the de novo mutations that occur in autism. Okay. Um, and that, yeah. this is our third area, this d- DNA effects. Right. Um, mm-hmm. what, what's, what else do we need to know about how EMF uh, affects DNA? Well, the main thing you need to know is that there is a large amount of evidence that human sperm uh, can have these DNA changes, DNA attacks on, on human sperm, and those are the same changes then that we know produce mutations in uh you know in in uh you know so so the linkage between the dna uh, changes and the mutation is very very well documented and uh in one one would expect then when you have exposures of the sort that we are exposed to often every day you know wi-fi cell phone radiation uh Cell phone tower radiation, etc. Um, when when you have those things every day, we're exposed to. Um, you know, you have to be very very concerned about what's happening to 
the human gene pool to what's what's the sum total of all the genes that we have in uh, in in humanity and how much contamination is going on of that gene pool because of high levels of of mutation and i have to say you know the 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 main evidence the, the most convincing evidence that we have that these these uh, that that we are seeing a, a big increase in mutation i think comes from the the autism studies that we talked about earlier <laughs> you know there's something going on there to produce these mutations in 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 the autism individuals and and they're becoming much more more common than they used to be so um yeah so 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 um you know we 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 have reason to be deeply concerned about about that and that's the third the third issue you know are are we in the process of destroying our gene pool and you know if so then we're extinct for that reason as well <laughs> Okay, so about the the DNA effects, Martin. How um, how far along are we in that potential, you know, potentially irreversible uh, change, genetic change in in humanity? And what do you feel, uh, according to the science, how much worse would going to five G be, just in terms of DNA mutations? Yeah. Okay. Well, look. First of all, this is not a potentially irreversible. Mutations are irreversible, and they are cumulative. As you just accumulate more and more, you, you almost never have a reversal of a mutation. Um, you know, it's extraordinarily rare to have a re- reversal of a mutation. So, um, you know, what uh, what we have here is is a situation where, um, you know, that that, that uh, things are inherently cumulative and irreversible. Um, now, you know, as I said, as I, 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 I alluded to before, in some ways, I think the autism genetics data is the best data we have that argues that we're already far along in terms of mutations. Because, I mean, autism, the autism, um, incidence has gone up something like, uh, 200 fold over the last, uh, 50 years or so. And, uh, you know, and, and when you've got 12 to 15% of those carrying these de novo mutations, you're talking about a lot of events. So it's still a minority, but it's still a lot of events. And, you know, and, and, and these are the mutations that are occurring in genes that influence the synaptic connections. But there are, of course, lots and lots of other genes that don't. So, you know, so, so, so I think that, that argues that we're already you know, pretty far along in terms of of the uh, uh, mutations based on the exposures we've already had. And, of course, again, the reason that I'm more so concerned about 5G is that the both the frequency and the incredible stunning amount of pulsation it will involve means that the effects on the VGCCs will be vastly greater. And, therefore, everything will be, uh, you know, hugely increased um and and uh, let me just say something more about that because when you look at double strand breaks in the cellular dna they have certain special properties and that is that <clears throat> when you have two double strand breaks in different locations you end up getting various kinds of chromosomal rearrangements but they're going to go up more or less as as uh, at least the square of the dose maybe even higher so that means when you see a much a much bigger effect from a huge amount of VGC activation, you could see gigantic increases, and I expect to see gigantic increases from 5G. So um, what the industry is doing with 5G is making it impossible, impossible for people to avoid this stuff. It's just it's just horribly it's just outrageous what's going on, and you know one of the things that we haven't talked about. Which I think is is terribly important. Um, that um, uh, Dr. Boyd Haley proposed that that the level of male dysfunction that we're seeing is caused by essentially the same mechanism that's involved in causing autism and, and ADHD, um, and. 
if that's true, and I think, and, and, and so both autism and ADHD are much more common in males than in females. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we know from, for instance, genetic studies that the same gene found in a male produces more severe effects than that gene found in a female. So for whatever reason, males are more sensitive to that, the issue of the disruption of the, of the synaptic, synaptic formation. Hmm. Um, and in the, in the, in the developing fetus. And, um, I think that, uh, that may be due to the unique hormonal situation of male, of male, uh, fetuses, it, it, you know, where you've got, you've got, you know, you've got testosterone produced from the fetus, but you also have a lot of estrogen and progesterone from the mother. You know, it may be things of that sort that are going on, but for whatever reason, Males are more sensitive. Well, so if this is what's causing male dysfunction and and the process goes on during the perinatal period, the dysfunctional males that we're looking at are mostly, you know, age 20 or, or, or greater or maybe 18 or greater. So they were in utero, you know, at least 18, 20 years ago and often much more than that when, when, the, when the exposures were vastly lower than they are now. Already. So if that's true, if, if Haley's view is right and we've had huge, huge increases in exposures, what it means is that we will have a gigantic, um, a gigantic epidemic of male dysfunction coming down the line from the exposures we've already had. How do you, how do you define male dysfunction? There, there are a lot of, a lot of things in, in, in males, uh, where, you know, we, we have, okay, males don't do nearly as well in school as they used to. Uh, males have, um, difficulty now in, in taking, uh, you know, taking responsibility for things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, I, I think, in fact, many young males feel that they're not functioning in the way that either the society or they expect. Mm-hmm. And so they are frustrated as hell about it. And for good reason. Um, I think that, you know, that, um, I think a lot of the, you know, political changes that we've seen are probably caused by that. Um, and, uh, and so those are, those are things that, that, uh, you know, are important. I, I think, you know, it, it's, um, there are all kinds of things that, that, you know, that we haven't talked about that are really major, major issues. Yeah. Uh, one of them being the fact that I, I, uh, the electromagnetic fields are actually physiologically addictive. I think we talked about that on the phone. Um, and, uh, and that's a, that's a huge, huge issue. Um, so, you know, as I say, every time I learn something new, it makes things vastly worse. You know, in 5G, the more you think about it, the more of a absolute total nightmare it is. It's just, uh, it is just incredible. Again, we can't, no, no rational society on earth can possibly take these risks. Yeah. What a wake up call. Okay, going on to the second, the fourth area, what reproductive effects, uh, you mentioned that you touched on this previously, but what reproductive effects have been yeah. observed in humans and animals from uh, or following EMF exposure? Okay, so, yeah, so again, you get, you get changes in the structure of the testis, structure of the ovaries, and those have been studied in animals. You get, uh, you get, uh, um, <clears throat> decreases in sperm count. Decreases in sperm motility, uh, and, uh, in lowered sperm, uh, quality based on other kinds of measures. Uh, you get lowered levels of, of oocytes, of eggs. That's been shown in animals. Um, you get, um, increases in spontaneous abortion. That's been, there's a lot of evidence in humans on that. And, uh, and you get, um, decreases in each of the three types of sex hormones and decreases in libido. So all those things are going on. Now, how far along are these in human populations? And here we get the really crucial stuff. 
So uh, there was a big uh, meta-analysis that was published by uh, Levine et al. Uh, in uh, 2018, if I remember correctly, uh, which showed that every that sperm counts have dropped below 50% of normal in every single technologically advanced country on Earth. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and reproductive rates in all of those countries, with a single exception, have dropped well below replacement levels. So they're running, they were running in, uh, 2016, I think, about 73% of replacement levels. That means you're going to have a, you know, a, a big drop in, in, you already have a big drop in births and you're going to have a big drop in, you know, children going through school and then workers and so forth, uh, within one generation. Uh, <clears throat> now you can say, well, maybe we got too many people. Maybe that's good. You know, maybe that's all right. Um, and that might be true, but what happened? Uh, so there was an animal study that was published by Magras and Zenos, uh, in uh, 21 years ago. Uh, where they showed that uh, young pairs of mice uh, put in little cages on the ground in an antenna park where the levels, they, they actually studied two, two levels, but both of those levels were well within our safety guidelines, so nothing should happen. But what happened was that there was an immediate drop within the first litter. So a litter in mice takes 30 days. They're really quick. So you can get a first litter in roughly 30 days and then a second litter in 60 days and so forth. Um, what happened at the higher level exposure is there was a drop in the first litter, drop in the second litter, no third litter. Wow. No third 90 litter. 90 days later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that apparently was ir- irreversible or almost completely irreversible in the sense you take you take them out of the EMFs and you don't see you see almost no recovery at all in the reproductive rate um, the same thing happened in at the lower level exposure except it took to the fifth litter to crash to zero again irreversible or almost irreversible um, so within a very short time period in mice you can get a complete crash in reproduction. Now, those mice were exposed under uniform conditions. That is, in each location, you had a uniform thing. So you expect them to be to behave more uniformly than they will in human populations where you have more variation. And in addition to that, uh, you know, things, as I said before, go roughly 15 times faster in rodents than in humans. So you wouldn't expect the, us to crash that quickly. Nevertheless, so then the question is, are we seeing any evidence for crashes in human populations? And I think now we are starting to see evidence of that. And uh, those occurred in uh, between 2016 and 2017 in three small, densely populated, high-technology East Asian countries. And those are Singapore, which had a 31% drop in reproduction in one year. Absolutely stunning. Macau, which isn't really a separate country but has separate statistics, uh, had a 26% drop. And South Korea had an 11% drop in reproduction within one year. South Korean government's been trying to stimulate reproduction because they knew it was way too low. And it's totally failed, as you can see. Um, the data for the first six months of 2018 for South Korea are out, and they had a another roughly 9% drop in reproduction. So I think those countries are going over the cliff and they're now down in the, in the well into the forties range of, of, uh, based on 2017, uh, forties range of, of what? 40, 40, uh, the 40% in the 40% range for, of, of, uh, replacement levels. Um, so, you know, within, you know, within a couple of years, they are, you know, if, if this continues, uh, they will be down, you know, they will be looking at the extinction right in their, you know, I think the rest of the technologically advanced countries will, will follow along within another couple of years. Uh, the U.S. interestingly in 2018 had a 2% drop in reproduction. That's not enough really to say, okay, we're crashing, but it may be the first part of it. And, um, you know, this is something that, uh, 
So I, you know, I, I think that, that we're looking at, again, we're looking at risks of the sort that no, uh, no rational society on earth can possibly take. We, we may well, uh, and, and again, uh, if we have, and these are based on the exposures we already have, obviously. Uh, if you have, you know, you put in 5G, it'll probably have a gigantic effect. A further expansion of 4G is probably going to have a gigantic effect. And, you know, putting radar in cars so they can drive themselves, that gives us a lot of extra exposures. I mean, we're running as fast as we can in exactly the wrong direction. And, and so here again, uh, we have every reason to think that we will probably have population crashes within a few years. I mean, I estimate something like four years at this point. Wow. It reminds me um, of that. Uh, that's amazing. I mean, it's really hard hitting. It reminds me of that movie from maybe 15 years ago called Children of Men, in which um, nobody knew why why people couldn't have babies anymore. And nobody okay. knew, maybe if we apply it to this real life scenario, is because of the incredible um, uh, prevalent, uh, super prevalent, uh, incidents of propaganda and industry spin and preventing this information mm -hmm. and fake studies by the industry. And all of this is really, you know, uh, positioning our, our scenario so that humanity is, is, is being threatened from being able to continue. So, so yeah. by people sharing this information and bringing awareness to it and then having solutions like Timothy Shackley talks about in the summit, like others talk about in the summit of go, that we can go to wired. It's simple. There's, there's examples of cities that are doing it. Um, you know, in reducing our wireless exposure, we, we're seeing now the critical need of, of getting this information out. So, you know, let us, let us avoid that scenario like in that movie, Children of Men, by getting this information out. So the fifth, um, just wrapping up here, a few, a few minutes, um, if we could, running out of time, but uh, the fifth area okay. is neuropsychiatric effects. Dr. Right. Paul, what are they, wh what does the science tell us about EMF exposures and neuropsychiatric effects? Okay, okay. Well, so what, uh, you know, I published a paper on this uh, in 2016. And what's interesting is that I keep discovering other people who have found similar patterns. Uh, at the time I wrote that paper, there were, there were, uh, two or three, uh, earlier studies that showed similar patterns. And, and now I know of, of, uh, a total of 10. That's interesting. So, so, you know, what, what I found was that there were, you know, that, that you, you get effects, uh, you know, people claim, you know, people argue and if they find I, I can't sleep. I'm tired all the time. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. My memory doesn't work. Uh, you know, there, 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 there are also, uh, sensory problems that develop in the eyes and in, in the ears and so forth. And, uh, um, and, and so, you know, uh, you know, anxiety and depression have become incredibly common all over the place. Um, um, lack of, lack of sleep, lack of concentration, you know, all, all these things are, are epidemic in our societies and almost everybody knows that. You can't miss it. And we know they're all caused by EMF exposures and various types of EMF exposures, not just, you know, not just one type or two types or something. And, uh, and yet we're ignoring this stuff. Um, the underlying mechanism is primarily a mechanism which has been studied in animals, and that is the brain function, the brain structure rather, is is impacted by these low intensity EMFs, and those things develop slowly over time, as do the neurological neuropsychiatric effects. Is what you see is that uh, is that uh, the brains of these animals, you know, they you start, you know, what was done. These these were done. These were studies. A lot of them done in nineteen sixties and even nineteen fifties where uh, you could take animals and expose them for different periods of time and then look at the structure of the brain. And what you find is initially the structure changes slowly over time. If you then take the animals out of those exposures, they will recover spontaneously. You put them in a low EMF environment, they will recover. It, you know, it'll take a couple of months or something, but they will recover. If you keep exposing them, 
the effects get more and more severe with time and they become irreversible or at least apparently irreversible in a sense. You, you take them out of the field and they still, they still have these. And you get absolutely massive effects on the structure of these brains. And one of the things I remember reading about was, you know, the average, the average uh, neuron in the brain has about a thousand synapses. And they were doing these studies and what do they find? They find a neuron that has Zero synapses. Zero synapses. Now, now you imagine go from something like a thousand to zero. How massive the effects have to be to produce that. And so, so you see these things, they become extraordinarily, uh, you know, extraordinarily powerful. So, um, and, 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 and there were also, uh, occupational exposure studies that were done in humans, which showed that these effects are cumulative. So you look, you look after, oh, let's say, you know, a year and a half, two years of exposure, you have modest effects. You look after six years and they become really much, much vastly more, more serious. So, so they become much more severe with time. So, you know, when you have these things that are already widely, uh, occurring in our populations, and where you have things like, for instance, people living near cell phone towers, people living within 300 meters of cell phone tower, which is probably 40% of the population, having substantial impacts on these neurological, neuropsychiatric effects. You know, I mean, we are, we, you know, we have major, major impacts from many of the exposures that we have. And, you know, all of this is covered up by the industry propaganda, but it's, it's really, uh, extraordinarily disturbing what, what is going on here. And so, um, you know, I, my, my guess, my projection, and this is based on what we know from the occupational exposure studies and what we know from the animal studies. And as I say, things typically go about 15 times faster in the animals. That's a rough estimate. Uh, you can make some, and I, my guess, you know, that I made about a year ago was, was that we probably had something like five to seven years until our collective brain function was absolutely crash, in which case we'll go into utter chaos. And I have to say, given what's happened over the last year, I think that's probably was a reasonable estimate. I mean, I think we're going down that route. And that's based on the exposures we already have. I'm not talking about 5G. I'm not talking about further expansion of 4G. I'm not talking about putting radar in cars. We, you know, the, we have every expectation that our collective brain function will crash. I, I guess now it's something like four to six years from now. And that, um, and again, that's completely apart from 5G. 5G might make it four to six months. Um, so you're talking about, okay, just to sum this up, I mean, this is obviously heavy for, for, for us yeah. all, but it's a, it's a yeah. science based realization of what could very well be happening to the human species. So this isn't fear mongering. It's not, it's not, you know, projecting based upon lack of facts. You are a scientist and you're professor emeritus and you're telling us that by pushing this wireless and micro millimeter wave uh, radiation agenda forward, we could have only a handful of years left for civilization as, as we know it. So well, we might have, no, I, I'm saying that, that given the exposures we already have, right. we may have only a handful. If we put out 5G, we could crash within months. And, you know, once, you know, if your collective brain function crashes, we would just go in utter chaos. Okay, so do you yep. have, with this knowledge and perspective that you have, do you have any hope for the future? Is, are, is there any, are there any silver linings? And if so, what would we need to do in order to preserve life, in order to have a, a safe and, and healthy future? There are lots of things we can do, but the first thing we have to stop doing is running as fast as we can in the wrong direction, and that's putting out more and more of these exposures. So we have to, we, we really have to block 5G. We have to block 5G. We can't have that. We have to really block a further expansion of 4G. Um, and, and, and the industry is trying to basically do both of them together and in, um, uh, 
And, um, you know, we have to stop putting radar in cars to drive themselves. We've got, we have to look very skeptically at any further exposure and we have to start reducing exposures. A lot of these exposures is not that hard to reduce. You know, um, we have countries that, uh, who, where, where they're, where, where cell phone towers can only put out 1% of the radiation that ours do. Like India, for example, cut theirs tenfold. They reduced their, their emission yep. standards by, by a factor of 10 a number of years ago, right? Based upon yep. what largely yep. the sterility and reproductive studies, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. So what can, okay, now you talked about you know, what we as a society need to do. What about at the individual level? What's a good strategy from your perspective? Is it, and others are speaking about this in the summit, but is it, it's getting together, sharing the information and is it, is it educating our, our local governments and, and, you know, having, having them teaming up with them to make a stand against industry's push? Well, I mean, ideally that would be true. I have to say, you know, I'm living in Portland, Oregon, which is, thinks of itself as a, you know, a right thinking sort of place. And the, and the city council and the mayor just caved on all this stuff. So I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a real challenge and it's not like nobody told them what was going on. Um, I, I have to say, um, we, we really, you know, I mean, we probably need a few, a few hundred thousand lawsuits is probably what we need. Like with Monsanto need- and, and that, that two billion dollars now in, in May of 2019 that, uh, the lawsuits there, we need the same thing to happen and swiftly in this wireless situation. Yeah. We need, we need, we need to do the, we need to, to really, you know, I mean, we need something that's the rough equivalent of what we did in World War II. This needs a major, major effort. It needs something that, um, where we have the sense of that if we don't do this, we will be doomed. And I don't think that is an overstatement at all. And, and, and let me just say, you know, the five, the five scenarios that I, that I just outlined, you can argue against them. You know, there are arguments against them. I don't think they're very good arguments, but there are arguments against them. And let's say, you know, maybe one or two of them are wrong. You still can be become extinct from the others. It doesn't, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, the point is that we're doing, and and there are lots of things that, we, you know, for instance, we don't need Wi-Fi for anything. We can do everything wired. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was amazed uh, when I went back to Washington State University after, you know, I gave a talk on this stuff. Uh, about, uh, when was it? About four or five years ago, short, shortly after I'd published on it. No, I guess it was about five years ago now. And I was shocked that, you know, since I left there, you know, they'd taken out all the wired connections. We had wired connections in every single office and on the campus. They put in Wi-Fi. I mean, how stupid could you get? Um, I, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and now we have college students who are, who are exposed to Wi-Fi all the time. And what do we find? We find the suicide rate skyrocketing. Level of depression is skyrocketing. That's not surprising. You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's just all kinds of stuff that is just simply uh, stupid. And, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're just, uh, um, I don't know. You know what, what's interesting about this when I, when I talk about these things and I say these things and these things are, you know, these things you need to think about them. These are outrageous things to say, you know, there's so, uh, there's so few people who actually call me on it and say, Oh, this is outrageous. Can't possibly be true because I think so many of us have the feeling that all kinds of things are really going wrong and we know they are going wrong. And, uh, and, and therefore when you hear something that makes sense out of how they're going wrong and why they're going wrong, it resonates with people's personal experience. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, so, so I, you know, I think, uh, 
Yeah, as I say, there are lots of ways we can move, make these Im- improvements. They are, you know, the hardest thing has to do with cell phones. But, uh, I'm sure cell phones could be, could be, uh, designed to be much safer than they are. There are patents that companies have taken out on how one can do that, but they're not doing it. And, uh, and yet, you know, so even the mo- the, the most difficult thing, which is cell phones, uh, and everything else can be wired. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. I'm just feeling the gravity of this <clears throat> and yeah. um, feeling the, um, responsibility to just really help this get out in as big as big of a way possible so that we can start making the changes at home and within community online community within getting connected with others other groups mm-hmm. um within educating oh, yeah. our yeah. educating our elected officials and mm-hmm. and really mitigating the harm and at the same time we need to stop these agendas we need massive lawsuits we need in power movements notice of liability process you know i've entrusted that to cal and the board yeah. and we need them to come out and to release that in a big way we need in the box lawsuits, legal action, like we're seeing with Monsanto. This is really like, um, I'm just feeling the emotion of this and I'm just appealing. If you're watching this, please help this get out and please get involved in this conversation. We're doing this from a place of love and from preserving life. And, um, and Martin is presenting the facts in a very powerful way that's challenging you right now as much as it's challenging me. I know that. Um, but, um, I just encourage you to be part of the solution. And, um, just trust in, trust in the essence of life that is bringing us together at this time. There are amazing things happening and transformations happening in the, in the world. We know that there is an awakening happening and we feel on the other hand, the compression, the tension, the, the death wish almost that the shadow side of humanity has. And so I just, um, invite and encourage you to be part of this. If you're watching this, thank you. And uh, I encourage you to go deeper and share this information and decide that we are going to save our species. We are going to take a stand for life, for our kids, and for everything that we value. So with that being said, Martin, I'm just so grateful for your information, for presenting this in a way that is so, um, you know, it's obviously, it's, it's challenging, it's heavy, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a wake up call. It's a reality check and it's science based. So, um, thank you so much. Do you have any closing thoughts for the, the, the viewers of this talk? Well, I just wanted to add something and that is, that, you know, there, there are approaches to shielding that can be useful and we haven't talked about those. Yeah. We have, um, uh, we we'll have other experts on the summit talk about those, but ab- absolutely. Yeah. Shielding yeah. fabrics, paints, yeah. um, wiring yeah. your, you know, um, your, your, your mice, your keyboards, your, you know, wired internet and so forth. Um, absolutely. But, um, I mean, the only other thing I'd say is that everything that you care about, I care about, anybody cares about is being severely attacked by this. Every, every single thing is being severely attacked. And, uh, I have to say my, my, my worst nightmare is that perhaps our collective brain function has already deteriorated to the point where we can't deal with this, in which case we're doomed. I certainly hope that that's not true, but when you look around the world and you see what's happening, <laughs> you have to ask the question. Uh, it, it's really, you know, it's just incredible what, uh, what's happening. So, um, yeah, it's... Um, it's, it's, it's real. It's getting real on the planet, on planet Earth. Yeah. Um, Martin, thank you so much again for your time today and, um, yeah. and for, for helping uh, wake us up to the reality of the situation. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Appreciate it. You're live. Michael. Okay, everybody. Welcome back to uh, Radio 5G. Uh, we have just been listening to the 5G Crisis Summit, uh, hosted by Josh Del Sol, interviewing Dr. Martin Paul on the, mm, well, let's just call it the overwhelming, hard, peer-reviewed scientific evidence on the, uh, on the effects of, of 
EMF and Wi-Fi, and he's really focusing on the existing effects, the documented effects, not projected sometime down the road, documented current effects of EMF and Wi-Fi uh, just with 4G, let alone what will happen and is happening with the <clears throat> heedless accelerated rollout of 5G. Uh, well, <laughs> this was about as mind blowing, mind numbing a recitation of grim, hard science as I could possibly imagine. And yet we've got to look at it. We've got to talk about it. And, and like Josh Del Sol says at the end there, you know, there is hope. There is an awakening happening. You know, there are whole cities and, and countries that are, um, shutting it down. Uh, but anyway, let's roll into this, Nancy. Um, are, are you still uh, standing after all this uh, hard to swallow stuff? I, you know, I knew this stuff. I said this stuff was happening, but I didn't know the gravity of it. I mean, when he starts to get into the details, I was fighting because my brain wanted to run away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and I no p- p- focus, 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 and I have to say I kind of failed <laughs> because I, there were times I'm going like, oh my god, what's happening? What is it? What is it that's happening? Oh my god, because I don't know. He he just has a way of taking science and kind of like making it into a horror movie. <laughs> well, you know, but at the same time, he was very dry and factual. And, you know, he would go into the specifics, the scientific specifics about, you know, proteins and uh, sperm motility and, and, you know, decreases. Let me just run through. Uh, I mean, hang with us, folks. Uh, you know, like sit down, grab a chair, grab a, a glass of fresh water with shungite nuggets in it. Uh, and just listen. Okay. Cause I started to write notes as we were listening to this. So this is Dr. Martin Paul, uh, as the radio, pardon me, as the, the 5G Crisis Summit, interviewed by uh, Josh Del Sol. Okay, so, and he's talking about documented increases in these various areas I'm going to share with you of the 4G exposure over the last generation or so, 3G and 4G and EMF, and talking about the massive increase in all of these factors that is hitting us with the rollout of 5G. So we have increases in Alzheimer's, autism, genetic mutations, impotence, sterility, decrease of libido, 50% decrease in sperm crown and motility, increases in miscarriage. These are mostly absorbed by the fetus in perionatal exposure. So this is going to roll out increasingly um, as the generations move on there is already an epidemic of what he called male dysfunction from the existing exposure of people now hitting their late teens and 20s an epidemic of male dysfunction mental impairment in males lower um, educational intellectual performance in males lack of initiative lack of responsibility if you want to talk about some of the stuff that is being you know, thrown at the millennial generation by um, the baby boomers. It's like, what's the matter with you kids, you know? <laughs> well, I'm not laying it entirely at the door of EMF and Wi-Fi exposure and genetic changes and brain impairment, but there's peer-reviewed studies that say this is happening. Um, and just when you talk about neuropsychiatric effects, documented, increased suicide, depression, anxiety, memory loss, eye and ear pain, insomnia, the the structure of the brain being impacted by EMF such that brain function in a single neuron is going from a thousand synapses to zero within a matter of, of two or three generations of studied in mice. And, you know, there's a reason they study mice and rats. There's a reason they throw billions of dollars in funding at studies based on studies in mice and rats. And that's because decades of research has shown that it is very close to the effects that take place in human beings. 
So don't you just say, oh, you know, those are mice and rats. I'm not a mouse or a rat. Well, genetically, yeah, you kind of are, you know, to a sufficient degree to warrant billions of dollars worth of research based on this kind of stuff. So he's predicting a brain function crash based on current 4G exposure. Based on what he's looking at, within four to six years, a brain function crash which simply means that we're staggering around like drooling idiots and civilization essentially ends. So this is about as grim as it can be. This is, you know, and he kept saying this line, no rational, sane society would undertake such a course. So if you're looking at the overall effects of sterility, population crashes, documented population crashes in Singapore, Macau, and South Korea of 30, upwards of 30% within a period of a year or two after increased rollout. We, we are looking at... Let me jump in great, here for a second because yeah. when he said that, I could understand Singapore and Macau because they're <clears throat> compact populations with a lot of high-tech stuff right there. But yeah. South Korea, do you know, think back, the South Koreans in the last Olympics, they, they put on 5G. 5G was oh. in, uh, throughout the Olympics, and I think that they are vastly more 5G than other countries. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Plus they had those those buildings exploding in fire. Or was that China? I think it was no, South that, that was South Korea. Yeah, when they uh, they switched on the 5G system and buildings started... Exploding. Three cities burned. Right. And how wonderful that they would take the elite athletes of the whole globe and irradiate them with 5G at the Olympics. Thanks so much. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really about as grim as it can get. And when you, you look at all this um, and think, well, no sane society would do this. So are we insane or is there an agenda? Whichever way you come down in the question is, doesn't matter. It's like your house is burning and the, the flames are, you know, are storming at your bedroom window and you're about to die of smoke inhalation. And you want to know, wait, 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 before I call the fire department, how did this start? I mean, was it the kerosene lamp in the basement? Or maybe Junior was playing with matches. Hold, hold on. I want to figure out how this started. It matters how it started because it, it'll help us to fight it. But the house is burning, folks. I think this is a quote from Buddha, too, about, you know, is there a God? Is there not a God? And he said, well, I could answer that question, but let's address suffering. Let's address the causes of suffering first. So we're addressing the causes and and addressing the remedy, addressing stopping 5G. This is great stuff from the 5G Crisis Summit. Um, on the encouraging side, because let's face it, this is incredibly grim, what Dr. Martin Paul has shared with us. On the encouraging side, um, they also are presenting proven strategies that are shutting down 5G towers, shutting down the rollout um, thousands, a couple of thousand of documented instances in which this is being stopped um, one of the most effective strategies being the definition of assault, criminal assault, the heedless rollout without permission of 5G in your neighborhood, on your block, near your house, is meets the criminal definition of assault. Don't take it to, you know, I mean, yeah, take it to your local council, take it to the state if you want to. Meantime, call the cops. You're being assaulted. And there are criminal actions, I mean, actions on a, of, of criminal charges being taken effectively. Because that's just plain out what it is, folks. You know, um, suicide, miscarriage, mental impairment, y y sterility, it it's overwhelming. And this is not just some nightmare scenario by some, you know, raving, uh, frothing at the mouth uh, conspiracy theorist. This is just hard science by an emeritus professor who's just dryly reciting the horrifying documented science on this so um <laughs> and Josh, go ahead let me get let me give you some good news okay because um and i haven't gone through to completely confirm this but I, this this is the activist post which are you know 
is fairly substantially certified. Um, <clears throat> and, okay, so it says, activist, okay, this was two days ago. Activist Post has already reported about states fa- filing lawsuits against the proposed Sprint T-Mobile merger. According to the wireless estimator, T-Mobile, T-Mobile is postponing, postponing, new builds, and 5G upgrades for at least now. A construction manager who wants to remain anonymous blames the 15 state attorney generals for filing lawsuits against the T-Mobile Sprint merger. Lawsuits have also been filed against the Federal Communications Commission for promoting and forcing 5G installations through American communities. So it, it's it's not a shutdown, but at least it's a hesitation. Yeah, that's the best news I've heard in a while. You know, because um, yeah, these massive telecommunications companies don't you know slow down or postpone or halt these massive rollouts without push back to the point where they have to stop and think, uh, guys and gals, uh, we could lose money on this. Uh, we might already be losing money on this, and people might start to actually um, hate us and our company. <laughs> you know? uh, so, yeah, that's that's really encouraging. Uh, there, there are there there are things happening all over. You know, uh, well, again, when we started this, we there was very little activity concerning five G, and basically, it must have been you know, a, a sudden awakening among so many people that they all took action at the same time because just about the time we get up, all of a sudden there's all these different really good sites out there doing good work. Um, so the awareness has definitely risen. Um, we have to present this hard scientific factual information because I can sum it up, but... You can sum it up, but, you know, where's the facts? Well, he is the facts. He's, yeah. pre- he's presenting it in, in no, no hesitation on his part. He keeps saying, look it, I can't tell you exactly that this is going to happen, but based on what the data tells us, this is what's going to happen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the, probably the most sobering point he made was the brain function crash that we have every scientific reason to expect because of what's already been seen, that it's already happening in the human population. We've seen how it happens in in rats and mice. Within four to six years, given existing 4G, EMF, and Wi-Fi exposure throughout the developed world, with the rollout of 5G, he said, you can shorten that to four to six months to total brain function crash. Uh, so, yeah, I would say time is running out, but it's it's never too late. It's not too late. I think the fact that we're sitting here talking, the fact that, you know, you look at the ramping up of, of censorship of information about 5G. Like in, in my uh, humble little world here on my uh, my YouTube account, you know, I've got YouTubes of our shows here on Radio 5G that I then share. You do the little, yes, I want to share with my community. And because I have more than a 1,000 subscribers, they'll let me do that in a single post. Now, sometimes I'm sharing devotional music, and sometimes I'm sending out to you know all these folks a YouTube from Radio 5G on the facts about uh, what the, what's coming. So I, I go to this function about a week ago, and I said, get a little notice that says, uh, this function has been temporarily disabled for your account. No explanation whatsoever. And I think we need to, you know, remind ourselves. It's so easy to think of like YouTube and Facebook and Google as being public utilities. Like they're just supposed to serve the community. Like you think about, you know, your electricity is supposed to work, your phone system is supposed to work because there's a utility and it's a public thing. No, these are private corporations. These are, you know, with agendas to protect. And they're not public utilities. They're not just part of the structure of the world. They're like the newspapers in the old days, back in the progressive era, a century ago, 
the big robber barons woke up to the fact that there were all these newspapers out there that were independently reporting on their horrific activities. And so they had a big meeting and said, you know, we ought to start buying up newspapers because this is really bad for us. And so, you know, the consolidation of media over the following decades has resulted in what we, you know, the the lap, the lame st- Stream, mainstream media, but it is very much the same. You know, Google, Facebook, YouTube are not public utilities. They are private companies, pretty much owned and run by the usual suspects up at the puppeteer level, who are kind of within their rights to say, yeah, you know, we've just decided we don't want to advertise the truth about 5G to the billions of people following these these services so we get we have a board of directors we have stockholders we're responsible to we have puppeteers up you know at the upper level so we're just going to do it you know and and we either accept it and say oh okay uncle google uncle youtube we're just going to accept your censorship you know we're going to be the sheeple or we find alternatives and we share the information so anyway that's my little speech on censorship it's happening well, that's disturbing. Um, okay, just for the people that are listening to us, um, remember, we have our own website. All the archives are up, and should we go down on YouTube, then you still got access to our sites. Um, if this continues to happen, it, it, let's just put it out there in our minds that it's not that the people that are there are going to start waking up because we need help we need the people who are engaged oh they get their paycheck because they're engaged in this thing what i th- what, what i think that dr paul was talking about and what you know is a is a potentiality is that these people are already kind of brain dead okay so yeah. you, you can't reach them I say we can reach them because, again, this show is about Radio 5G, but every time we come onto it, the solutions are in something that is beyond just the reality that we're confronted with. It's forcing us to look to a deeper spiritual side, an energetic side of connection. Because this is so awful that if we can't tap into a a mind, okay, versus a brain, a mind that can overcome the damage done to the brain to continue to function correctly. See, this is what I think, why I think that they're running. He kept saying we're running. Yes, because too many of us are getting the, getting the idea that we can actually engage a higher consciousness of ourselves instead of being dumbed down and so the more of us that jump to this you know situation the less effect they're going to have because remember we're energy bodies inside a 3d body we can make changes faster than they can as long as we understand the mechanism of it and begin to engage our imagination because that's the key to it and, you know, just start fixing things with our minds. Yeah, and it's not as if, you know, at the upper levels, and let's just thumbnail sketch it briefly regarding the puppeteer scenario, the cabal, you know, Committee of 300, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they're not a monolithic, unified, top-down, all-powerful structure. They've got competing factions within their reality, but they certainly know. From many decades of science, let alone, you know, whatever dark metaphysical practices some of these cults may have, in, you know, engaged in for centuries, they know on a scientific basis the reality of mind over brain. They know it. There's a reason that there are huge departments for remote viewers in the intelligence communities of the major powers. They know about this stuff for a very long time. They know that when you start to make changes in consciousness, that there is a corresponding shift in all the sociological economic factors so dear to their hearts. They do all this, the metadata on all this stuff. So, you know, we just ask you to come along with us, folks, on this, what Nancy is pointing out here. 
You know, this is not woo-woo time. This is just as hard science as what Dr. Paul has just shared with us about how consciousness is the lever that we can seize. And I wanted to share with you briefly, uh, I'm not recalling if I touched on this last week, but a pretty solid, let's just call it, um, uh, you know, a, uh, a story, a series of, you know, what do they call it, episodic evidence or um, whatever. I'm going to roll on with it. Um, we had here in Colorado uh, a visit from a woman named Mary Hardy. And so this is we're, we're going straight into the spiritual here for a little bit, folks, and then we're going to veer it back to the science. And Mary's in her early 80s, and for the last 25 years, she has been um, practicing a protocol for shifting energy and consciousness using the ley lines of the planet and using a, a demonstrated technique of breaking through the bandwidth of negativity, the narrow bandwidth within which human consciousness has to function for the puppeteers to remain in control. And she and a small group of people have done this in various power places around the world, and now their their goal is to share what they refer to as the Holy Grail Vortex practice with the world. And they have just multiple instances where, like, for example, in the year 2012, in London, when the whole world was gathering for the Olympics in London, the reality of what was planned to take place during the Olympics in London, uh, let's just call it a, you know, a convenient terrorist incident that she was instructed, okay, go with your group to this location in Salisbury Plain. That's Stonehenge, all right? And so as has happened in multiple places in major power spots and cities throughout the world where they have done this, they simply stand in a circle and they begin this protocol of the Holy Grail Vortex, an exercise in consciousness and energy shifting. And within minutes, within like half an hour to an hour, out of nowhere, they're getting buzzed by black helicopters and guys in black SUVs show up because they monitor this and they see where there are punctures in their control grid by us using our sovereign power and using sacred technologies, and by that I mean sacred to life, sacred to freedom and life and joy and growth and thriving. Sacred in that. Let's not get into spirituality and religions. Let's just talk the basic level of sacred. Um, so that's what, just speaking personally for myself, um, I relate to it as a Templar stream of sacred knowledge passed down, and you know, I'm not talking about 20 different groups out there saying we're the Templars, no, we're the Templars, and I'm not talking about the lineal restoration of a of a medieval order. I'm talking about sacred community, preserving sacred knowledge, and enhancing the spiritual freedom and health of humanity. So this is just, that's another lever that we have, the biggest lever in my mind. And yeah, lawsuits, criminal actions, talking to your state, to all of that, all of it all at once. It There is hope, and it's not merely hope, it's actually happening. Um, the awakening is happening. So, anyway. I want to know what happened with the helicopters. Oh, okay, so they get buzzed. You see, they get buzzed. And Mary Hardy's information is that there actually is, at upper levels, a treaty. You know, if you talk about off-planet presences and and the control folks down here, and now oh, they're interacting with a you know uh, an ET species with a dark agenda, but there is something like a galactic federation. You folks can buy this or not, but this that, that there actually is a treaty, and that if we're not using a device, if we're not using some sort of you know orgone-powered physical device as part of these protocols to break through the control grid, if we're just exercising our sovereign power as reflections of God in the individualized human soul gathering together to do this protocol, which I'll be happy to share with people if they're interested, um, if you do that, 
if you're just using your sovereign power, no device, they cannot interfere with you. If you're using some device, some machine, some box, they can arrest you. And so all Mary and her people are doing, they're just standing in a circle, and they're doing this protocol, and it involves... It involves energy visualization, counterclockwise and clockwise movements together with the Great Invocation, which is one of the most beautiful prayers I've ever heard. You can look it up. The Great Invocation on Google. Dag Hammarskjöld, first Secretary General of the UN. Uh, it was given to him. It comes from an ancient source. It's very well known. A beautiful universal prayer to um, expiate the dark energies and and free humanity in the spirit of, of brother sisterhood. So... Um, See, so, yeah, so basically, she told a story. She told us a story. This is Mary Hardy. They're, they're near Stonehenge. They're on the Salisbury Plain. It's 2012 in the Olympics, and they actually broke through this energy grid that was going to be used by a dark faction to pull off something horrible at the Olympics. That stadium is weirdly constructed for a reason. And um, so up comes this white van, and the white van parks – and they take out a couple of, you know, those traffic cones and they set up a sign saying, um, you know, something like uh, cable crew. doing. And these two guys are sitting there watching them from a distance of about 50 yards. And it's not like there's any, you know, cable antenna nearby that the guys are working with. They just show up out of the blue. They stand there uh, pretending to do something and observing them from a group. Finally, Mary, who's you know, been tracking these people have been tracking her and, you know, black helicopters and SUVs in, in Egypt, at the pyramids, at the, at the Magdalene sites in France, here at Stonehenge. And she just, you know, walks over a few steps and says, hey, it's me, Mary Hardy. You've been following me a lot. We don't have any devices. We're just doing some praying. Have a nice day. And the two guys just, you know, get embarrassed and drive away. So anyway, that's what tends to happen if all we're doing is is getting together. And doing this Holy Grail Vortex, which you don't need to go to Salisbury Plain and Stonehenge or or Giza to the Great Pyramid. You know, do it in your backyard with a few friends. Uh, if enough of us are doing this, it's another major lever that we're pushing, and they cannot stop us. Well, can you explain how to do it here? I sure can. And uh, if you will do some um, some talking uh, out of your great font of wisdom for a minute or two – while I go pull the link to a video in which Mary explains the Holy Girl Vortex and uh, how it is done, I will pop that onto uh, to our box here, and you can share it with everybody listening. How's that sound? Okay, we can do that. Okay, all right. I'm I'm going to mute for a minute or two here, and uh, and get back to you, and you can share your wisdom, <laughs> which is considerable. <laughs> share my wisdom. Um. I just want to, I just, this is really a long kind of a, a science thing, but in the last week while I was w- working on the Shungite book, I got off into, uh, Sir Penrose and, um, Hammeroff, Dr. Hammeroff, their theories concerning where consciousness is. And it's a combination of a quantum physicist, and a co- and a doctor who is an anesthesiologist who wondered what happens. Well, how is it that I can put somebody in, because of drugs into a state where their mind's not really working? Yet so many people have these afterlife experiences that seem really real to me. So they began to collaborate. One kind of on the metaphysical medical side, and the other one totally into the quantum side. And what they came up with was a focus on what's called the micro, microtubule system in the cells. Every cell has a, like a scaffolding, a structure of these little micro or, you know, tubules. And it was, it's like it forms the shape of the, the, the cell. Well, inside of this, don't ask me how, but inside of these things, <clears throat> there is a connection to the, quantum field so within these little micro tubule system it's a quantum connection and it became their belief that well from hammer off the doctor's standpoint whatever is holding consciousness 
can't be requiring much energy because otherwise it would disappear because I got this body pretty near dead. And the quantum guy who says, well, you know, I think if you've got this kind of a structure, you're going to create a quantum connection. And they came together to believe that every time we have an aha moment, you know, two and two is four. Oh, oh, I finally get it. Aha. That in the brain, they've they've seen it, they can record it, uh, changes the brain and you put out a gamma frequency. It would seem that the gamma frequency is tied to the microtubular system. So every time we have an aha moment, we're building a consciousness and that consciousness is also connected at the quantum level. So there is a tremendous amount of science, so hard science, involving what we're talking about when we talk about the mind body. It's not the brain, it's your consciousness. Okay, so I don't know, Michael, are you back? Not yet. <laughs> okay, so. Um, uh, give me just another minute. I'm going to put up one more link. Give me one more minute. Okay. So, um, what, 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 what I want to try to convey here is that. We have developed a science called enterology, which is a combination of metaphysics and quantum physics. And that's why I'm so absolutely enthralled with what these people, these two physicians and doctor, he's Sir, he's actually Sir Penrose, because what they said was, he, they, they got creamed when they came out with their theory, but what they said, especially Penrose, look, it, if... I'm right, then you're going to be able to, in a little bit of time, measure this, this, and this, and this. Just test for it. And so over the last, I think, about 10 years, um, other scientists have been trying to disprove him, or maybe prove him, but they proving that what he said would be within those microtubule things as far as quantum measurements would exist, and they do. So it's a, a theory that resonates with me, and there's a lot more to it. Um, I did write it up. I couldn't imagine why I was writing it because I was actually talking about the C60 molecule doing the science section of the book. So I don't know. I just figured, okay, for some reason they wanted me to, you know, get this information down. And then right after that I had a lot of confirmations as to why. It, it was things like, how does how do twins know what the other? How do they feel? Well, because they're so closely uh, have a same frequency, so close to the same frequency that the frequency is being unique to everybody else. Every microtubular system within a human body is only picking up the information that's got the frequency of the person that they're in, so to speak. Are we back? We are back. Okay. Okay, so I have uh, shared on our Skype text here, and it'll be shared um, in the YouTube as well. Um, the Holy Grail Vortex Prayer, it's an 18-minute uh, YouTube from Mary Hardy, and then a shorter um, description of just a couple of minutes um, of how to actually perform the Holy Grail Vortex Prayer, which, just as another little reminder, um, if you want one proof of the efficacy of it, um, when Mary has performed this in various spots around the world, um, she gets buzzed by black helicopters and black SUVs. They can't do anything. They've never arrested her or harmed her, but they monitor where we are breaking through the control grid. And this is simply uh, a, a protocol of working with energy and consciousness to do that. Um, I would like to share... Uh, the great invocation um, with which they open this this uh, Holy Grail Vortex Protocol. Uh, it's pretty short. Nancy, are you good with that? This was given to Dag Hammarskjöld, the first Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, so I'm going to read it, okay? Absolutely. All right, here we go. The Great Invocation. And by the way, um, within the Great Invocation, uh, the name of Christ is used, but in alternate versions, um, some say um, religions which believe in a world teacher, a coming one, uh, the Imam Mahdi for um, for many Muslims, uh, the Kalki uh, avatar for certain 
uh, Hindus, the Bodhisattva in, in Buddhism, Lord Maitreya. Um, in this version, it is it is Christ, but you may use which term calls your spirit. The great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Amen. Aho. Make it so. That last part is just me. So that is the, the great invocation, um, which was given to, um, to Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the, the very revered, um, first secretary general, uh, of the United Nations. Um, I just read to you from the lucistrust.org, L-U-C-I-S like Sam, T like Tom, R-U-S-T dot org, lucistrust.org. Um, it was given out in April of 1945. It's been translated into over 80 languages and dialects and is now um, distributed worldwide. So that is the invocation that is used by um, Mary Hardy and, and her group. And you can, um, if you look up, Say you do a YouTube search, uh, Mary Hardy, that's just spelled just like it sounds, uh, H-A-R-D-Y, Holy Grail Vortex, uh, do YouTube search. Um, she has uh, a number of different, um, YouTubes, uh, sharing the, the simple method used, um, for the Holy Grail Vortex, which is a highly powerful, uh, tool of, of consciousness and energy in attunement with uh, what we will call the divine, with the divine will. And uh, I personally met Mary uh, a couple of weeks ago. She had felt um, a long-time urge to come to Crestone, Colorado, here in the pretty high vibrations of the San Luis Valley, specifically because she had been told there was a Templar community here that her Templar guides, her intuitive guides, uh, strongly urged her to connect with. Well, lo and behold, here we were. And so um, we got together at a friend's house, and she shared this remarkable uh, sacred tool with us. So, you know, among all the many things we need to do, like contacting your local county commissioners, filing criminal charges against, you know, people who are assaulting you with 5G, all the tools that they're talking about on the 5G Crisis Summit. Personally, I just wanted to share this uh, this one with everybody because this may be, who knows, you know, it, it's harder to document the science on this one. Black helicopters and SUVs are one indication, but this may be among the most powerful things we can do. And there's other things. <laughs> I yeah. Mean, this is just one example. Um Again, every place out there, anybody who is, you know, imagining what can happen can, will have an impact because it's, it's all energy. And the fact that they're having, they must have a really nice group of people that are all vibrating in a very uniform kind of way to create an energy field of that, of that force. Um, find your group. You know, even if it's just you and, and, and your friend or your family member, spread it out, you know, get somebody else. And also, go over to CosmicReality.net, please. Just look at the information that about the hats and about the cards, because we've got t-shirts now, and now some other people are taking the same, you know, doing the same sort of thing. 
just go over there and get the ideas. And yes, you can purchase them from us. But go and get the ideas of, of ways that you can just start to bring people around you together. Because you put the baseball cap on and people who are already twigging about 5G, they see it and then they and you have something to bring you together. If you don't advertise that you're a 5 you know, I mean, that's what baseball caps are for, <laughs> advertising <laughs> what you believe in, you know. And um, just, again, on the local level, get together and start go, just putting yourselves together. Because we've got to, that's what it's all about. It's an opportunity for us to come together. It's just like Dr. Paul said, 5G is, is you know, it's all over. That's why I keep saying that, no, Shungite is not going to help you in a 5G situation. We've got to stop that, period. Otherwise, there's, there's you know... We have to stop it. There is no otherwise. <laughs> yeah, there's no escaping it. Just because you think you've shielded your home, you know, <clears throat> um, it's in it's in airports, office buildings, schools, libraries, uh, as you walk down the street. So, you know, to protect your home, great. Well, you may little live a little longer in a world full of drooling, impotent, dumbed-down, anxiety-stricken, depressed maniacs. Uh, who are starving because the bees have collapsed and there's no food. Uh, you know, just one little hard science predicted scenario. So yeah, well, we gotta well, stop the good, it. The there's good nothing news, else to do. We gotta stop it. The good news here is that there will be nothing here to reincarnate into. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yeah. We don't, we won't have to reincarnate into this life again. I personally like this life. I want it to go on. I want to make it better. Um, and that's what why I do what I do. Um, I, I I just am. Well, there were so many things that he said that I, I kept saying, "Oh, I got to remember that phrase," you know. Um, but but in the bottom line was that Joss finally said, "Well, do you have any hope?" And he's like, "Yeah, there's a lot of things we can do," you know. And that's why you got to understand how bad it is to get motivated to really. I'm sorry, fear is a great motivator. And, you know, to get into the concept that, no, we're running out of time. we got to stop this right now. Yeah, it's like, you know, uh, I think it's Josh's organization. I think Dr. Deborah Green may have mentioned it. Anyway, I picked it up somewhere with the saying, look, we know this is all terrifying and scary and grim, but it, here's our motto. We scare because we care. Okay? So when you take what Dr. Martin Paul said, here's a quote from him, what we just listened to an hour ago. Everything we care about is being severely attacked. That's just a scientific fact. Your children, your home, your ability to enjoy life, your your ability to, to sleep, your ability to, to to live, this has this cuts through every last political barrier or you know demonizing oh the red and the blue and the you know, the Trumpers and the libtards and all. I mean, let's just cut to the chase, folks. We're all human beings who who want to live and be free and have kids and have good food and, you know, be able to pursue our dreams. Uh, it's like Thomas Jefferson, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is under severe attack. Documented, hard science, irrefutable, hundreds of peer-reviewed studies. This is just hard facts. So... Um, if this doesn't motivate you, nothing will. This is going to be like the test. How do I know if I've been dumbed down already or not? Well, if you're not waking up to 5G because of what we're sharing with you, that's the answer. There's your answer. You're already dumbed down. You know, have a nice drooling day and the rest of us are going to get on with trying to save the planet. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but not much. It, it's a war. I mean, you know, yeah. but we're strong enough that we don't have to go to war. All we have to do is get right in ourselves. Exactly. And, you know, and please don't discount Shanghai. <laughs> you know, I, oh. I mean, I was I was listening to him and the dumbed down thing, and um, I just before I got, you know, uh, the business closed. I was detecting things, <clears throat> excuse me, in my own brain, where I seemed to be slowing down, glitching, 
you know. Mm-hmm. And I've been with somebody that was really always into my own brain. I think that's why I've been single all my life. I didn't have enough time to think about anybody else. So, um, and yes, I got uh, t- tamarind that uh, turmeric, t- turmeric that is very good for the brain, but. After I got the shungite and I started playing with the shungite, and this was like a good two years after getting into it, I suddenly, and I talked about it on live radio, I felt like my brain was being, you know, recircuited. And I kept saying, I'm telling you people, if it's happening to me, it's happening to you. Now, I can't say that it was the shungite that was... um, uh, creating an environment where that could where that could occur, or whether we're into an energy environment that that's exactly what happened, you know. <laughs> Hold one, talk for a second. Okay, yeah. So I've felt the the same responses. You know, I I don't think I had noticed a major impairment that bounced back, but I've got a, a shungite. Um, silver impregnated nugget around my neck as I'm speaking here. I've got a bottle right here, water bottle, metal water bottle with three shungite nuggets in it. And, uh, you know, the other measures you can take to create a shungite environment in your home. Put a shungite magnet on your fridge. Cuts down your electricity bill and keeps your food fresh. Put one in your car. You know, it, it's got just this this amazing documented energetic effect and uh, Nancy and I talked to oh eh, maybe about three weeks ago about when you you actually are merging with the Shungite energetic field you are deliberately attuning with it because it responds to conscious intent these are quantum concepts here um, you become essentially what we refer to as a Shungite being and that that is a level of bio enhancement and health and spiritual strength that we believe, we're just saying, um, will afford a level of protection against all kinds of harmful things out there. We're not saying that this is an ironclad guaranteed protect you against 5G scenario, but, um, my personal belief is that it's about the best thing you can do because even if you, you know, go totally to wired technology and, you know, avoid 5G whenever you can, if you're living a normal, you know, technological life and you're in any kind of urban areas as most Americans are, there's not going to be any escaping it. So carry around the personal protection of a 5G environment in your being uh, and the water you drink in the shungite uh, that you choose to wear. Uh, and, you know, go check out cosmicreality.net. That, there's all kinds of sources for shungite. You know, do your own research, but the integrity of, of the products there is very high. I can vouch for it. Um, Nancy and her team, you know, Derek Condit uh, and others have been doing very high integrity work and research and it's it's the verified high quality shungite that that you'll receive from them. Anyway, that's my little plug for for Nancy. But just to reiterate, shungite protects against EMF and Wi-Fi up to 4G. On based in the hard science level, it does not and will not protect you against 5G per se. Um, apart from you know, the, the energetic factor that I've described, which is anecdotal and not backed by peer-reviewed science. That's just our personal opinion. Uh, we've got to stop 4G and absolutely stop the rollout of 5G for the sake of Gaia, the biosphere, and the future of the human race. You know, um, another uh, thing I'd me, like let, to mention Let me just here. jump Go in ahead. here because we've, jump got in. To, we've, got Go to, for we've got to remember that what what Dr. Paul was talking about is 4G caused, not 5G. Right. And what we're saying is that we can turn it around. He said that people taken out of the fields could get their cognitive capabilities back. I remember the rats. I think it was the rats. But the thing of it is, is that if you get into a Shungite environment, and you can buy Shungite, you know, in a lot of different places, we guarantee ours. Money back guaranteed. Okay? So 
you can get the shungite and then you're going to get yourself back out of what we've already done to ourselves within the 4G. So that then you can fight 5G. <laughs> so you, you, you're right. awake enough to be able to, you know. So yes, shungite will inevitably, you know, help bring down the 5G crazy. Um, but it's more from the standpoint of allowing you to get back to a point where you're an authentic self and in control of your own mind. Exactly. There was a study done. And I often cite this when I get resistance from like family members or friends or whomever. Conversation veers this way. I start to share some of this grim stuff and they like, you know, put up their fingers in a cross like I'm a vampire or, you know, they, uh, yeah, you've joined, you know, the tin hat group. And I say, look, there's actually been studies done which show that so called conspiracy theorists who are people who are open minded to evidence that is presented to them as compared to people who need to keep their heads buried in the sand, need to not have their worldview shattered, need to, you know, just run from cognitive dissonance as fast as they can, are in fact psychologically unhealthy, out of touch with reality. Those are the folks who are the deniers those are the folks who call us conspiracy theorists are the ones who, in fact, are suffering from, you know, a, a kind of mental impairment by burying their heads in the sand uh, out of fear and denial and the inability to handle cognitive dissonance. So um, all brought yeah. on because of EMF and Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, demonstrated. So. Yeah. So we're coming up. uh Towards the the end of our time here, how many minutes we got left, Nancy? On on we're, your counter we're there. We're over right now. Okay. Well, we've shared with you um, the Holy Grail Vortex Prayer and a short version of it. Also, that's Mary Hardy's um, remarkable energy and consciousness tool that um, can help break through the the energetic net that's over uh, the human collective consciousness. It's been shown to be effective, and then. As Josh Del Sol was saying, and we thank him uh, and all the people at 5G Crisis Summit uh, and Dr. Martin Paul, who he interviewed today, um, you know, there's a wealth of information available at the summit. We encourage everybody to go to the 5 gsummitcom And this is Radio 5G, Michael Henry Dunn, uh, with my co-host Nancy Hopkins of CosmicReality.net, joint project with the Sacred Academy of Global Evolution in Colorado. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. There is hope. We will win, and we are winning. And that we is just humanity, folks.